Peter, thank you so much for this uh, for uh, this time that we have on a Thursday evening. Um, I don't know for those of you on the phones. I hope you can see our our nice logo. It looks um, it looks so good. Dynamis Power Hour. It's an hour that we're going to be busy with the Word of God, um, for the love of the Word, because the Word of God is our foundation, and. Uh, um, you know, we're excited that we know that the, the Word and the Holy Spirit has got, um, you know, uh, there's so much ability to do so much in people's lives. And uh, we we trust in the Lord for even tonight in people's lives. We do believe that the Word of God has got a, when it goes out, it will have a rippling effect in people's lives. It's not stopping with people that are listening. It even goes further. That's the ability of the Word and the Spirit. So we're very excited there's a great expectancy every time the word of God is being ministered. And uh, we thank you. Father, we thank you for this time. Wherever everybody is sitting tonight, whether it's in a lounge, whether it's in the kitchen, maybe even in bed listening. Um, Father, we thank you that your word is very much alive by the spirit of God. And as we just said, Father, it's got the potential to do something in any situation in any person's life at any time and even tonight so uh, we thank you for this opportunity and we honor you tonight in jesus name again very welcome to everybody we're excited about tonight we are in a almost a season um, of celebrating the death and the resurrection of jesus christ and that's pretty much the topic for this evening um, and uh, i really believe that we need to almost sometimes di discipline ourselves, even though we, we've, we have Christ in our lives and it's a daily, it's a daily walk with the Lord. Um, there comes, uh, comes a time that we need to, um, you know, we need to sit down and we need to reflect and we need to uh, um, thank God for what Jesus Christ and thank the Father for what Jesus did and to thank Jesus Christ for what he has done. And, um, I want us to understand during this time, we are not celebrating an event only. We are celebrating Jesus Christ. As you are, you know, there's so much hype around this time. It is a long weekend. And, and you know, to be honest, you know, it's a, it's a time where people rest. It's a time where people go and visit. And, and uh, having the Easter, the Easter um, feeling and, uh, and so on in its, I don't want to say that it's, it's, it's wrong, but we as people of God, we are the remnant or the people that believe in Jesus Christ. We don't necessarily celebrate the, 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 uh, the, the event um, that has happened. We are celebrating more Jesus Christ, the one that has given us life, the one that has paid the price. Um, and that's why we are here for even tonight. You know, it's a Thursday evening. You can do anything really you want to. But um, for those who are on, you've chosen to be here and just to just to listen again. And the word has got an ability to to do something and to bring revelation, even on the death and the resurrection of Jesus um, in this time. And um, as you are listening to the word, anything can happen. A great revelation can come that can change your life. So we are pretty confident always on what we are doing, even on a Thursday evening. Um, so the points that we're just going to touch on tonight, and uh, we're going to read a lot of scripture because it's not about our opinion. It's not about um, what we think. It is about what the word of God says, and we need to hear the word of God, even if you just have to listen. You know, it's uh, listen to scriptures, and we're going to do some reading, and you're going to listen. And I want you just to discipline yourself because you're on the, you know, you, you're on this, uh, use this time well, um, uh, um, you know, to hear and let the Holy Spirit work on the word. So the points that we're going to discuss tonight is uh, the world's biggest problem. We're going to touch on that, the sin issue, the Isaiah prophecy. Uh, Jesus informs about his death, that's his disciples and the people that were walking with him and around him. What Jesus really experienced on the cross before uh, and on the cross, the crucifixion, but even before um, what it means when he said it is finished, um, his last, almost his last words, in fact, the last words that Jesus 
um, um, got out of his system. It is finished. And then it's not just about the death and the, res uh, the resurrection. Uh, it's not just about the death, the crucifixion of Jesus Christ, but also that's pretty much part of the gospel of Jesus Christ is the resurrection of Jesus. Jesus is not on the cross as the Catholics little um, thing that we, uh, they are wearing, you know, with Jesus on the on the cross. Jesus is not on the cross. Jesus is uh, uh, the grave is empty. He was resurrected. And we're going to look at the significance of the resurrection in our lives today. And uh, we have touched some time ago, I think two weeks ago, on the ascension of Jesus. So tonight I want to ask you, maybe maybe just quickly, if somebody wants to, to do this, to respond to this, what is the world's biggest problem? What is the currently the world's biggest problem that we are facing? Is there anybody that wants to just out of your head, just throw from the hip? Uh, you can just quickly unmute yourself and then close again. Anybody, what is the world's biggest problem? Who wants to try? No, unfortunately, I can't. You want to go? Yes. Can I go? Yes. 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 Yeah, this, uh, the, the biggest problem in the world is the middle letter and the word sin. <laughs> okay. All right. Okay, guys, yeah, I, we're not going to go on. I think that is really the, the biggest problem that the world and the people and, and, and we as humans are facing in this world is not violence. It is not a racial issue. It's not even globalism. It is not COVID. It is not whatever you call it. That, can, that is only the result of sin. Sin is the biggest issue from the beginning where Adam and Eve, right through, where people rebelled against God. They were in rebellion against God. And as Johan was saying, that's S-I-N, that I in sin is all about myself. And we know and we are seeing this uh, every day. Where people are making gods of themselves, they're making gods of other people. It's all about me, myself, and I, and it's not about God. But part of that, so that I in 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 sin is what it's really about. The sin issue from the beginning, whether it's uh, whether it's killings, whether it is terrorism, whether it's whatever it might be, relationship, divorce, whatever it might be, uh, um, the the foundation and, 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 and the root is really the sin issue. And we all know when that, when that has happened in the Garden of Eden. Really, I think we need, to, we need to see the bigger picture. And we need to confront the bigger picture. And we need to understand the bigger picture is sin. Rebellion against God. And the Bible says in Ephesians 2, verse 1 to 13, it says the following in Ephesians 2. Therefore, remember that previously you, the Gentiles in the flesh, and that is us, were called uncircumcision by the so-called circumcision, which is performed in the flesh by human hands. Remember that you were at the time separated from Christ. I want you to hear this. Separated. Sin separates. We remember what happened in the Garden of Eden. God had to let them go. He, he exited them from the Garden of Eden. In fact, he exited them from his presence. Separation came because of sin. There is a big separation between man and God. We know that. It's impossible. It's impossible for man to, man always tried and, uh, you know, tried through good works and so on. But there is a separation. There is still today a separation. Um, and, and, and that's why sin is, is, is just, it's havoc on, these, on, on the earth. You know, it's going crazy. Um, there's so much happening. Um, you know, the lost, the, um, well, it's, I, in, in fact, it's many years now where people are just, you know, what is right is, is wrong and what is wrong is right. has become uh, uh, good. What is sin is okay. You know, you, we watch TV, we watch uh, whatever it might be, and we, we see that sin is just so rampant. And in many cases lately, 
we are saying that sin is actually good. People are saying, but that's the way to go. You know, uh, coming against the order of God. It's man. It's about man. It's about uh, um, the man God. It's about man's kingdom and, and, and that selfishness. So, Johan, you are quite right. Sin is the is issue. Now, the issue is in, in Romans 3 verse 20. Now, this is the crisis. This is the crisis, the humanity crisis. The bigger picture, whether people know it or not. Uh, um, the crisis is that death or sin leads to eternal death. In Romans 3.20, for the wages of sin. So there is a consequence. There is a consequence for every human being walking and living uh, on this planet. The consequence of sin is death. And that is, that is eternal death. You know, and we need to we need to understand this. There's a bigger picture where God is looking at humanity. You know, and we just uh, uh, the people in this world, we're just going on and we just do our thing and we continue in sin and the nature of sin abounds. And because of sin, there's evil. And because of that, you know, the devil has got influence in people's lives and he's running so many countries. He's running nations. So evil abounds because of sin. That disobedient to God, that rebellion against God. But the wages of that is eternal death. And there's so, there's so, there's so few people that understands this. You know, that when you die, you go to hell. You go to a place forever where God is not. And this is, this, this is, this is tragic. People are, we're just going on. We're just going on and try to make it and survive in this life. But the wages of sin, whether you are good whether you are a, 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 a young adult, whether you are white or black or green or, or Chinese or what, the wages of the sin nature in you, in the peoples of, of this world, because of sin, the sin nature, the wages is eternal death. And we know, you know, from the beginning, from the beginning, God reached out. You know, he always reached out to people, but we have made that decision. And, uh, you know, we through all the, you know, the Old Testament, we've, we've seen in many ways how God through covenants, and we're not going to specifically tonight uh, touch on the covenants that God made with people or made with himself, but also made with people to bring people closer. We know he was always reaching out to people, but still even his own, even his own people rejected him. Even the Israelites rejected him. You know, 400 years in captivity, 400 years they were they were enslaved. Um, God took them out through Moses, um, the uh, the great leader. God took them out. He he brought them into freedom, but still they were um, uh, rebelling against him. They were disobeying. So sin continued in people's lives. That effect of sin, and God put in place the laws. Uh, um, uh, um, you know, the Ten Commandments, God has put some, some laws in place that foreshadow Jesus Christ and what he, would have, what he would do and the price that he would pay. But all the time, there was a sin issue. All the time, the people tried to, but it wasn't good. It was never good enough. So we're looking again tonight at the death of Jesus Christ and the significance of the death of Jesus and also the resurrection of Jesus. So there's a prophecy, a prophecy in Isaiah 53. Now, Isaiah 53 is in the Old Testament. Now, it, uh, this Isaiah 53 is really a, a chapter that makes the, the, the Jews very uncomfortable because it speaks about Jesus. And they don't, they, you, you know, remember, they don't believe in Jesus Christ as the Messiah at all. You know, so they are very uncomfortable with this, with this chapter, but it's really uh, uh, based on scholars. This is a prophetic word, and Jesus himself also refers to Isaiah 53, and it's explaining, it's 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 showing what is going to happen. What what there there will be someone, there will be someone that will do something to to make things right, and this is so interesting. And we're just going to quickly uh, read in Isaiah 53. What the word of God is saying. And we're going to read. And I want you just to. Um, in the light of Jesus Christ. We know what Jesus did. Just see 
what Isaiah is saying according to, to Jesus and what he would do. And then we will quickly, quickly run through this. So Isaiah 53 verse 1 says, Who has believed our message and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a tender shoot and like a root out of parched ground. He has no stately form or majesty that we should look upon him, nor the appearance that, that we should be attracted to him. He was despised and forsaken of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, and like one from whom men hide their face. He was despised and we did not esteem him. Surely, oh, this is, this is, surely our griefs he himself bore, and our sorrows he carried. Yet we ourselves esteemed him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But he was pierced through for our transgressions. He was crushed. Yo, look at this word, crushed. He was crushed for our iniquities. The chastening for our well-being fell upon him. And by his scorching, we are healed. By his wounds, we are healed. And all of us like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to their own way. And But the Lord has caused the iniquity, iniquity of us all to fall upon him. He was oppressed. Look at the strong words again. He was oppressed and he was afflicted. Strong words. And yet did not open his mouth. Like a lamb. Like a lamb that is led to slaughter. And, uh, and like a sheep that is silent before its shearers. So he did not open his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away. And and as for his generation who considered that he was cut off out of the land of the living for the transgressions of my people to whom the, uh, the stroke was due. His grave was assigned with wicked men, yet he was uh, with a rich man in his death because he has done no violence. And then it goes on. So this is Isaiah prophesying. So Isaiah had an encounter. Isaiah not necessarily saw a vision, but he had this experience about someone Someone that will that will be this person that will make it right, that will deal with the issue, issue of sin, that will deal with the issue of man. And this is this, this is what he is saying. And he's saying, and I, I it's very important to just to have a look at the verses. It says in verse 2 that this person, and let's 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 call it Jesus. Let's it's Jesus. Jesus had no heavenly glory when he came down. So he came from a position of glory, authority, of, of eternity, and he stepped into this realm of time in a human form. No glory at all. He walked on this earth as a human being like you and me. Isn't that amazing? The only difference we know is, and this is the big difference between, between Jesus and us, is that he had no sin. But in all other aspects, he was a man that was confronted. He was tempted. He grew up. He was a baby, toddler. Uh, uh, um, he grew up a young adult. He grew up in wisdom and understanding. He grew up to become a powerful man and, and a great man in, 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 as a human being. But he lived his heavenly glory. Verse 3 says, but he was despised and forsaken. He was despised and forsaken. Very important. He was despised and forsaken, not just by, he was despised by men, but he was also forsaken. We're going to look at that a bit later on. He was forsaken by his father. Remember the words of Jesus where he's saying, my father, my father, my God, why have you forsaken me? I want you to understand that Jesus Christ, there was purpose for him to come. It is not just another person who died. It's not just another person, uh, a, a human being that died for his friends. No, it was God who became man, who stepped into our position. 
He took, a, he, he accepted everything that man and humanity threw at him because there was purpose and he was doing. Verse 4, he says, he bore our griefs and carried our sorrows. Isn't that amazing? So yes, we're going to look at the sin issue. How Jesus is dealing with the greatest issue in our lives and in humanity, and that is sin. But for us as individuals, there's more than that. Just when he, de when he deals with sin, even in his body, when he deals with that, his stricken body, his, his almost mutilated body, he, he bore the, our griefs and he carried our sorrows. Isn't that amazing? In the very depth of our being, not just our sin, but the consequences of sin, the result of sin, the grief and the sorrow he bore on him. He took upon him. Right. Verse 5, he was pierced for our transgressions. So we're going through this list to see what really happened with Jesus or the, what the prophecy is foretelling, what will happen to, to Jesus Christ. He was pierced. He didn't just hung on the cross. He was pierced. You know, there was a spear putting inside of him. There was so much, you know, he was, he was pierced for our transgressions, our wrongdoing. And I was speaking about Jesus Christ, this prophecy, these transgressions. We have done wrong. We have planned wrong. We were wrong. We were in nature sinful people, but he bore that out for our transgressions. Again, there's a powerful word. Jesus was crushed for our iniquities. He was crushed. God the Father allowed Jesus, and this is the words in the Bible. He was crushed. He didn't just hung on a cross. He was crushed. He was crushed for our iniquities. And scourging, we, uh, we are healed. Through his wounds, we are healed. We're going to look at that a bit later on as well. Jesus had wounds. You know, this picture of Jesus, I'm just sketching you the picture, the, the foretelling what Jesus would do. And that helps us to understand the bigger picture of what Jesus really went through. I want you to understand that Jesus, the picture that we see so many times of Jesus and a little droplet of blood next to his from from his head because of the, the thorn uh, um, uh, that's been put in his head. There's a little droplet. No, 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 no. Jesus was um, uh, with all due respect. He was messed up. His body was messed up. It wasn't a good picture at all. So there's, you know, it, there was a crushing. There was a piercing. You know, he didn't look well. People couldn't, re you know, recognize him. He was sh swollen. He was sh swollen because he was beaten. But this word crushed means so much. It is just explaining what Jesus Christ has gone through. Remember, remember, the issue is sin. But somebody came to, to, to rectify that. Somebody came to, to, to nullify that. And that was Jesus Christ. The Bible says all have sinned and gone astray. We'll touch on that later on. So he's still busy with the prophecy. He was oppressed and afflicted. It's pretty much in his mind, in his the battle in his mind that he had to go through. So we're going to look at it wasn't just physically what he has gone through. It was in his soul dimension, what he has, what he had to go and the fight in his mind. And also the spiritual fight that he had. The spiritual, and it was a fight, people. He didn't just say, listen, yeah, here I go. And, and, and it was smooth going. Jesus really uh, um, went through so much. And we need to understand more and more and more what has happened there. And God himself, and he gave himself as a guilt offering willingly. And again, I bring it back to verse 2, where the prophecy is saying that he left his place of glory, his position, and these, I don't know what that conversation with Nestle be. He said, Father, I will go. Um, you have commanded, but I will go and I will, I will become and I will give myself willingly. He wasn't forced. Willingly, he will give himself as a guilt offering. Isn't that amazing? So even in Isaiah, so you can understand why the Jews are just saying, you know, this, this cannot be. They, they are very sensitive about this portion in Scripture. They are tiptoeing around it that said it was maybe Isaiah, Isaiah himself or maybe the prophet Jeremiah or a, a, a leper, in fact. But this is pretty much, 
You know, nobody else except Jesus can give himself as a guilt offering. So it shows even in the Old Testament, God is God was foretelling what uh, what needs to happen and what would happen. So then we 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 see Jesus um, is his birth and he's growing up. And we know about the baptism of Jesus Christ. We know uh, the, the ministry of Jesus Christ. And as we go um, in this uh, almost uh, up to the 33rd year of his life, Jesus started informing his disciples that, uh, that he's not going to be there forever. Jesus is starting telling them that, um, um, you know, that he's there for a purpose and that he has to die and that he will, um, that he will suffer and that um, then he will go away. And I'm pretty sure the disciples were, you know, at the time very uh, amazed because Jesus became a friend, um, uh, not just a friend, more than a friend, a brother, um, just more than a brother. They were really looking up to Jesus Christ. But we need to remember that Jesus was there, was here for a purpose. So he started informing his disciples about the crucifixion and his resurrection and his ascension. So we're going to look at John 12. Now, this is now the latter year of Jesus Christ or his last year, his last um, months even. And we're going to read from John. And we're going to read from verse 27, the following, where Jesus start informing people about what is about to happen. And it's very significant. Listen to this. It says in John 12, verse 27, from the verse, verse 27, look what Jesus is saying. It's written in red in my Bible, so it's the words of Jesus. He says, my soul has become troubled. Yeah, so there it comes. It's not just Jesus' physical pain that he went through, and we will look at that. It is his soul. He had the, his soul. He, he knew it mentally what, 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 what is coming. Remember, he is a human being, Right? He is a human being. He didn't do walk this earth as, as you know, with, with, with uh, uh, super, yes, he had supernatural abilities because of God in him. But he was pretty much a human being like us. So he says, now my soul has become troubled. And what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. But he says, but, he says, but for this purpose, I came to this hour. So there was a purpose. Verse 27 or verse 28 says, Father, glorify your name. Then very interesting. I want you to hear this. Then a voice came out of heaven a second time. Now, people didn't pick it up. They said, I, uh, I have both glorified it and will glor glorify it again. The name of the Father. So the crowd of people who stood by and heard it were saying, that it had thundered, it was thunder. They were hearing thunder. And others were saying, maybe an angel has spoken to him. Jesus answered and said, the, this voice has not come for, for my sake. Verse 30, this voice has not come for my sake, but for your sake. I want you to see the bigger picture again. I want you to see the world is in tremendous trouble as it is. Listen. The world is in tremendous trouble. If you die now without Jesus Christ, you will go to hell and there will not be another opportunity. How, how crude that might sound. This is the will of God. This is the, this is the truth. This is a, Jesus, Jesus came for a purpose. He came for, for his father's purpose, for the sake of the people on this, in this world, for every human being. Uh, um, um, that has lived. Verse 32 says. So 30 says that this voice has not come for my sake, but for your sake. Now judgment is upon this world. People, this is the words of Jesus. I want you to understand the seriousness of what is happening here. The seriousness of the death of Jesus. He was so serious about it that he says to them. Now judgment is upon the world. As we are sitting here, as you are hearing the words of God, there's judgment on those people who are rejecting what Jesus Christ has done, who, has, who are uh, rejecting the love of God. 
there's judgment. Now the ruler of this world will be cast out. And I, verse 32, says the following. He says, and I, if I am lifted up from the earth, I will draw all men to myself. So Jesus is saying again, he's speaking about his crucifixion. And that lifting up um, in verse 30 says, but he was saying that to indicate the kind of death by which he was to die. So he lifted up from the earth. And we know with, with the crucifixion or people being crucified, you're hanging, you're hanging between heaven and earth. And the Bible says he will be lifted up. He was speaking about his death. He will be hanging in, you know, between heaven and earth. But he will be hanging uh, um, as, a human, as a human being. So verse 28 is pretty much... Uh, uh, so I'm going to read to you John 16. John 16 says the following. I'm just going to find it quickly. It's actually verse 16. 16 verse 16 says the following. And Jesus again in red letters. In a little while, and you will no longer see me again. In a little while, uh, um, uh, you will see me. So some of the disciples then said to one another, what is this thing that he is telling us? In a little while, um, and you will not see me. And again, a little while, and you will see me. And Jesus says in red, because I go to my father. So again, it's just confirming again, Jesus is coming from the Father to the world, but he's going back to his Father to what he needs to accomplish. Isn't that amazing? So Jesus is foretelling his uh, crucifixion. He's, he's explaining to them that there will be a, you know, there will be a, a well, in, uh, you can go and read it. There's a resurrection coming and there's also ascension where he's going back. So he's informing his disciples. Now, we're getting all closer to the death of Jesus Christ. And we're looking at the Last Supper in Matthew 26. Um, and we're going to, to just to have a look at the verses there. Matthew 26. Let me just quickly get there. Matthew 26, verse 26. While they were eating, and Jesus is with his disciples, is very, very close Um where they will be taking him in custody and, you know, all happened. We're not going to go through that, uh, the Garden of Gethsemane and, and so on. While they were eating, Jesus took some bread. And after blessing, he broke it and he gave it to his disciples and he said to them, take it, this is my body. I want you just to, just for a second there. So it's not just about the blood of Jesus. It is also about the body of Jesus Christ that is being stricken. It is being mutilated. It is being uh, pierced. It is, it is, uh, uh, um, there's, there's so much, there's so much that the body of Jesus Christ had to go through, the body of Jesus. And he said to his disciples that they need to, uh, um, they need to take it so they must receive it and then they must eat it. Very significant. You know, people, there's a, there's a lot of people that receive Jesus, but they don't eat Jesus. Now, I'm not saying eat Jesus, but they're not, they not engaging. They're not, they not embracing. They're not going in. They're not walking in it. They receive, but they're not walking in it. So we're looking at the body of Christ. And he took that bread. That bread is not a nice sliced bread. It's a rough bread in those times, big. He broke it. The Bible says he didn't cut it. He broke it. He broke it. So the body of Jesus was broken. It does something to me. It was broken for me. It was messed up for me. And Jesus said to them, take and eat. This is my body. And we, when he had taken a cup and he has given, he, he gave thanks and he gave it to them, the cup, and he says, drink. So he, again, he gave it and then he wants them to do something. He says, drink uh, from it, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for forgiveness of sins. 
But I say to you, I will not drink of this wine in the wine from now until the day when I drink the new wine in my father's kingdom. But he says, verse 28, for this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. So we see two things here. We see there's, there's, there's significance in the body of Jesus Christ. And we're going to look at that. The body of Jesus, that was, that was, that was, uh, um, what's the right word? I'm just struggling to find the right word. Messed up. They say there's a scripture in Psalms where David is saying, and he also had an experience, you can go and read in Psalms 22, but that he also speaks about a Messiah that is coming. Not saying it's Jesus, but he speaks of, of, of that you could even see the inside of that person from the behind. Now we know what, what happened with Jesus prior to his crucifixion even. His body was mutilated. He was whipped with a, a whip with stones in it. And that's what that's how that's the custom of the day. 39 lashes. Listen, they say 40, most people die. But Jesus took that. He took our sickness, whether it's sickness of the body, whether it's sickness or ailments or whatever it might be, sickness in our soul, sickness in spiritual sickness. He took it also in his body, even before. Right? So the body has significance. And the blood has significance as well. And we're not going to get into the blood covenant, but blood speaks of life. We know that Jesus, all the blood in his body, were, were they were just, um, um, it just flowed. From where they, where they uh, you know, um, the lashing that he got, that 39 lashes. Listen, the, the blood flowed. You know, we will, we will read on, you know, the crown that was put on his head. It was heated on his head. It wasn't just put on. Put on nicely for him not. No, they hid it into his head. Those, those thorns went into. There was a lot of blood. In fact, there was no blood left when Jesus died. But we'll get there. This is pretty much just uh, uh, Jesus also just foretelling and explaining to them that he once, when he did the Lord's Supper, um, and uh, that's why we do communion. He says, do it as often. Do it as, as often because it reminds us constantly of what I have gone through and what I have done for the people. We should not forget this. So what did Jesus experience? What did Jesus experience um, during his suffering and his crucifixion? Okay, we spoke about physically what Jesus experienced. 39 lashes with a whip. And this is pretty heavy. Listen, this is this is where we cringe. This is where we, you know, the 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 Physical pain. Jesus went through, listen people, crucifixion is one of the worst uh, ways of dying. One of the worst ways of dying. And you can actually go and read the medical, um, the medical thing behind um, uh, um, how people die in the crucifixion. At the end, they're actually dying of a heart attack, of a heart failure. Not just because the emotional, but because of the pain and the position that they were put on the cross. So he carried his own cross. So after the 39, he carried his own cross. Listen, that is not a little plank, you know, a, a plank. This is a, a rugged piece of wood. He couldn't carry it because he lost so much wood. And there was a, there was a gentleman that helped him with that. He carried, he, he carried his cross. His beard will put pulled out. There's significance in the beard. There's, there's, some, there's some deeper meaning of, of the beard. But that was painful, you know. Yeah, I've got a beard. I, I saw Voter has got a big beard, big beard now. So if his little son comes and he starts pulling the beard, I tell you, uh, especially in the, the, the places here, you know, it's, uh, it's quite sore. Jesus was beaten up. Jesus was beaten up, people. They pushed him around. I bet you they, they hit him with fist. They kicked him. Yeah, this is, they, he was treated like a murderer. He was treated. He was treated. Treated badly physically. He was nailed to a cross. We know about the nails. He was nailed to a cross. And then the crucifixion, as I said. The crucifixion in itself, people. Go and do yourself a favor. And we shouldn't shy away from these things. It is, it is, it is, uh, it is, it is bad. It is really, uh, this, this, uh, go and read it. It will, it will shock you. The physically what Jesus went through. But also mentally, Jesus went through 
a lot of things. He, um, he was rejected by his own people. His disciples that were close to him were, were not even there. John was there, but they were not there. So he was very much alone, you know, hung in between heaven and earth. He was alone. He was spat on. He was mocked with a purple robe. There was even a sign on, on, on the cross saying, you are the king of the Jews. So they made a mockery of Jesus Christ. They made a mockery of him. He was despised. So mentally, mentally imagine as a human being what he what he knew that he must go through. And, and listen, it's not just what it's not just a death for a friend. He knew that he that he's going to carry the sin and the grief and all the of every person on this planet upon himself. So what a challenge mentally. He went mentally he went through, but that was not the biggest. That was not the the the, the one of the, the biggest things that could have happened with Jesus and his experiences he had was when he on the cross because of us, he was saying, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why have you forsaken me? Remember, Jesus hung on the cross. The Bible says the spirit of uh, left him. He became the sacrificial lamb that carried the whole world's sin upon himself. It's not a small feat, people. He did. He it is nobody could do what Jesus, nobody ever could do what Jesus did. He was pure, powerful place in heaven, most high place in heaven. Come and, and become a man and become where people despise him, mocked him. And uh, and when at the end we said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And he was made a sacrifice. Isn't that amazing what Jesus did? When Jesus said it is finished. You know, he said in Hebrews 10, um, what, what, is, what he was saying, there, it's a legal term. It is finished. When he was saying, it is finished. It's a legal term. Hebrews 10, verse 19, 20 says, Therefore, brothers and sisters, since we have confidence to enter the holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new living, uh, living way, which he inaugurated for us through the veil, that is through his flesh that was, that was, that was on the cross, Listen, it is finished. Legally, we've got access to the presence of God. And I'm asking you, how many of us are really entering the presence of God? Every now and again, no. God won. Now we've got, the, we've got that confidence that we can have. We can be in the presence of God. The veil has been torn. There is so much that happened when Jesus was crucified. There was, there was, a, there was an earthquake. It became dark. There were supernatural things that happened. And the veil in the temple that was very thick tore from, from, from top to bottom, saying, this is done. You've got access. You are not separated from me anymore. The potential is there. I have paid the price. Legally, I've paid the price. I've gone through, I've gone through so much. I've given myself as a sacrifice forever and ever and ever through the blood and through, uh, through his, uh, uh, through the, uh, the blood in his body. He had gave himself, he died. And after three days, this is incredible. It's just after three days, Jesus rose from the dead. Jesus appears, appeared to um, more than five, 500 people. And that's pretty much evidence that Jesus Christ well, is not dead. You know, so we're not going to go through it. But Jesus is pretty much alive. There's evidence, factual truth that Jesus rose from the dead by the power of God. And why is this significant? The resurrection guarantees us that we will not remain dead as well. But we will too will be resurrected. Secondly, the significance of the resurrection of Christ gives us assurance that our salvation is an accomplishment. Right? When we, we receive Jesus Christ, we say with our mouth, we confess that Jesus Christ rose from the, uh, that Jesus Christ died on the cross. And we also believe that he was resurrected. It's part of our salvation. It is the gospel of Jesus Christ, not just the death of Jesus Christ, but the life of Jesus, or the resurrection of Jesus Christ is the gospel. We are, we've been risen. We have been, uh, yeah, we've been taken and, and, and uh, uh, rise up into a new life with Christ. Romans 6 verse, um, Romans 6. I believe you can hear me. There it says, therefore we have been buried with him through the baptism into death. So that just as Christ was raised from the dead 
through the glory of the Father. So we too may walk in newness of life. Isn't that amazing? Newness of life. We've heard this before where God says, for those who are in Christ, for those who, who, who are not just believing that Jesus has done something, but that's actually receiving and partaking of the death of Jesus Christ. The Bible says those people, those who are in Christ, will have a new life. The old is gone. The new has come. And that's in 2 Corinthians 5 verse 17. The new has come. We are new in Christ Jesus. He says, and that our old self was crucified with him in order that our body of sin might be done away so that we, we would no longer be slaves to sin. For the one who has died is freed from sin. Now, if we have died with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him, knowing that Christ have been raised from the dead, is ne will never die again. Death no longer has master over him. We've got a new life in Christ, people. We've got a new life in Christ. Jesus Christ has paid the price, the ultimate price for this current world, for your father, your mother, your wife, your children, your, your colleague at work, your, your friend, if they are not born again, if they have not embraced what Jesus Christ has done as the living sacrifice that took and dealt with sin once and for all, they will be separated for God in eternity. But God has come in the form of Jesus Christ. He has become that sacrifice so that we are not separated anymore. The veil is torn. We are in Christ. We are seated with him in heavenly places. We are part of the kingdom of God. But through what Jesus Christ has gone through. Isn't this amazing? And this is what we are celebrating. We are celebrating Jesus Christ. He's death and his resurrection. We are celebrating the father that loved us so much that Jesus, that he sent his, his son, Jesus Christ, whoever will believe in Jesus will not, will not, uh, uh, um, will, will, will receive eternal life. Isn't that amazing? And this is what God wants for us. It's very re re uh, relevant. And I close with this. Let's celebrate and understand Jesus paid the ultimate price in the, in, in the, in the, in the, platform of eternity what jesus did was so amazing the bible says the angels were dumbstruck they couldn't understand what is happening it's in the word of god it is so amazing what he has done it is the most crucial it's the most powerful thing that could have happened in all of eternity where jesus came became a man for us so we can live eternity eternally with god the death and resurrection of jesus christ as, as relevant in the name of Jesus Christ. And let's, uh, let's celebrate him during this time. We thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So that is that for tonight. Yo, you know, uh, um, there's so much that one can say, but you will, we will send you this uh, uh, um, verses that you can go through. This is your life. This is your future. This is not just some... This, this, Death and, uh, death and resurrection of Jesus Christ is what it is all about, people, in your life. Paul saying that is the very center of my being because it, 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 it established me in the kingdom forever and ever and ever. We acknowledge Jesus. And Jesus, thank you so much that you not just obeyed, but willingly became the sacrificial lamb that you take took our sin, my sin, my sin, your sin, my sin, everybody in the world's sin upon you. So whoever receives that, eats it, takes it, participates in it, embraces it, will have everlasting life. Amen. Voters, thank you. If there's any questions. Yes, thank you, Pastor Hannes. That was very insightful. Um, a lot of facts, um, a lot of uh, uh, it's encouraging. It's encouraging to hear everything again. And uh, we thank you for, for the teaching. It is really insightful this evening. Um, so, yes, I just want to ask everyone that's uh, online with us tonight, if there is a question, can you please, uh, yeah, if you've got questions, if you can please raise them and uh, we will gladly answer them for you. So, if there's anyone, please un unmute yourself and you can ask the question.
Anyone? Is there anyone with a question this evening? Uncle Alvain, do you have a question for us? Hmm. Yeah, but there's so there's so many things that you can that you can question. But I think, like Pastor Hannes correctly said, you know, when Jesus took that cup and he looked into the cup and he saw the sins from Adam until Revelation of everyone that did anything is going to do anything in that cup. And he said, let this cup, let this cup not pass me by. You know, mm -hmm. can I not, can I not get, just allow this thing to pass me by? But he said, then not my will, but your will be oh. done. You know, and I think if, if when Jesus saw that, I mean, we must also understand that Jesus knows like God, he knows everything. Yeah. So he must have known when he gets hung on the cross and gets crucified, that his father is going to turn his back on him. He must have known that. Sure. Even 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 before he went, when he was in the Garden of Gethsemane, he knew that his father was going to turn his back on him. Because if his father didn't turn his back on him, then there would be no remission. Because he, when he took the sin, he became sin. So so that separated him from the father. Because that's a scripture that Pastor Hannes read, and he must have known that. And I think that must have been the most most crucial decision that he made knowing that his father was going to turn his back on him and he was going to be forsaken yeah but yet he knew also if he didn't do that that the world would be lost and what he was sent for would sure. not be fulfilled so yeah it's powerful i think i think and like you correctly said i think we must we must take more cognizance of what easter is about it's not about yeah. the easter bunny and the eggs and the holiday it's it is a significant time because if it wasn't for this you and i would be lost forever like you yeah. said we would not be here we would be condemned to hell for eternity yeah, yeah. oh well, thank you for that i just want to just finally i want to make this this statement and uh that the death and the resurrection of jesus christ demands a response. He demands a response because Jesus, it is not just somebody somewhere of a religion that came. It is for humanity. So it demands, there's a demand, there's, there's, there's a demand, uh, um, a, 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 that, uh, a demand for every person on this planet to respond because it was not, not just the death, a normal death of a person. It was this, it was saving mankind. And we need to see this bigger picture. I'm going to repeat it again. The death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ isn't just a fact. It isn't just a person who died. It is God who intervened, right? Brought salvation, restoration to Jesus Christ. But it demands, it demands a response. That's why we should never, never be too sensitive around people. Uh, to, to tell them about Christ and what he has done. It demands a response that we need to respond because it demands, it is big, it is life. It's about eternal life. It's not just a small feat. We, we will not understand or we don't understand the significance really of the death and the whole, you know, the whole, what, how God intervened through the Old Testament. And I don't want to carry on with this, but I'm, I'm, I'm not just, it's not about excitement. It's about the truth that must set us free. It, the, uh, his, his death and resurrection commands a response to give our lives and to embrace what he has done. It is what he has done is, uh, well, we need grace. We really need grace to understand what he has done. And thank you, God, for that. Thank you, Walter. Thank you. Yeah, well, thank you, Pastor Hannes. Um, uh, very good, very powerful. Um, I think just the last word, a lot was said. I think that Hannes, your slides, your teaching is very insightful. And um, we will send it out to everyone. And I think the last word of encouragement is to study them. Uh, because it's not just a story about the resurrection. There's teaching in the story um, about a lot, of, a lot of principles that we can all learn. So, yeah, let's be encouraged to celebrate. Um, you know, Jesus is with us. And um, he loves us yeah. and we love him. And there's a call yeah. to action always. So, um, yeah, let us not just celebrate the story or the significance, but let us all go out and um, at least proclaim the name of Jesus this yeah. weekend. 
Um, I think that's the call to action tonight. So, Pastor thank you. Thank you for everyone um, that's online this evening. Uh, I am blessed. I'm sure everyone else is blessed. And, um, yeah, let us come back next week. Next week, we're going to carry on with uh, Power Hour. Um, and, um, yeah, so thank you for everyone this evening. Enjoy your long weekend. Um, be good. Be safe. And, um, yeah, let's celebrate Jesus. So before you go, just unmute and um, say goodbye to us. We would love to hear from you.